Buckeyes live every Wednesday. Here we are, 11 a.m. Eastern time. We invite your comments and questions. Talking Ohio State football with all of you with a new man running the offense. Uh, we will get the takes on down the line. And again, comments and questions are welcome. Kevin Noon's right next to me. Buckeye Huddle in the Big Me podcast. We got Tony Gerdeman, BuckeyeHuddle.com as well. And Buckeye Weekly's the podcast. Steve Hellwagon just below me there. Bucknuts 247 Sports. Guys, how are we doing today? Good. Doing well. Doing great. All right. Well, it was supposed to be, and it was Bill O'Brien for two or three weeks, uh, but that's uh, college football these days where guys take positions and they don't even complete a football season and they move on. So this is a new thing in college football, just like a lot of other things are new to the last three years of college football going forward. Kevin, we got uh, Chip Kelly, kind of a strange, I'm trying to think if I can come up with another example of a uh, mentor who then becomes uh, the 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 underling of sorts years later. The, the mentor, of course, coached and uh, was on staff uh, in charge of uh, Ryan Day at one point and now is working for Ryan Day as offensive coordinator. Yeah, I, I've always joked in my career that I try to treat my coworkers well on their way up because I may need a handout on my way down. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's apples to apples at this point, but uh, I told I told fans if they didn't behave that they were going to run Bill O'Brien out of town, and lo and behold, they did after after three short weeks. But uh, yeah, this is a unique situation uh, bringing in somebody that has been so instrumental in the development of Ryan Day as a coach not maybe not so much as a head coach since they have been on separate paths for almost a decade now but uh going back to the days as ryan was at university of new hampshire and then chip kelly was a coach there through his nfl stops etc 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 you you have to wonder at some points if this was the pick that ryan would have wanted to make just right out of the gate but there, you know, I think there were some confusing things going on. Chip Kelly was also looking at maybe some NFL OC jobs, things of that nature. I think at some point you want to kind of break up the band a little bit. But when when Bill O'Brien left, it was it was painfully obvious that uh, Chip Kelly had been fully vetted and everything else since that. Just uh, from the point that the Bill O'Brien really seemed to kind of be official, it only took mere hours for uh, for Kelly to be. Uh, tapped as 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 the replacement, and I'm, I'm looking forward to see how these guys work together. How you know how Chip handles more of a a subordinate role. You know, for being honest, it didn't look like Chip was having a whole hell of a lot of fun at UCLA through the years. But then again, he also is not uh, Lane Kiffin on the sidelines with the uh, with with the gesticulation and all all of that type of stuff. So. Um, Good hire. We'll you know we'll we'll see what bears fruit there. Is Ohio State still working to fill out its coaching roster with uh, the tenth position still uh, unaccounted for as of this morning? I, I like what Chip Kelly's going to bring or should bring to the running game with what he does, and you pair that with the Ryan Day passing game. I think uh, to your question, the only it's not even similar, but when uh, Urban Meyer was Ohio State's head coach. Earl Bruce was in the press box behind us cussing out every single third down incompletion. So, I mean, that was, there was some mentor mentee thing from, from Urban's time at Colorado state under Earl Bruce. Uh, but uh, that's about as close as uh, I can recall in terms of that sort of stuff and, and at least college football, but it is interesting. I know that's one of the reasons people are concerned about how, uh, how they will mesh in terms of Bill O'Brien brought in some fresh looks and some, some sandpaper to uh, to the smoothness of of the Ohio State offense and program, and so you're wondering, well, now does does nothing change with Chip Kelly coming in? Is it still Ryan Day's thing, and will they fall short here, or there, where Bill Bill O'Brien was going to rough some stuff up? Jim Tressel used to say, if it ain't broke, break it. Even though he never actually really followed his own advice on that, so this would have been one of those things where. Ryan Day tries breaking it, but then 
fixes it by bringing in Chip Kelly because Bill O'Brien left. But I think it's going to work out pretty well. I, I was a little surprised by the three-year deal. Uh, I, I don't know that I expect him to be here for three years. But if he is, I think, you know, that's that's a pretty good sign that things are going well, obviously. Uh, and he'll have – I, I, I'm I'm wondering if he even wants to be a head coach in major college football anymore right now, or at least until things are settled, because this is not the same coaching job that he took in whatever it was, 2018 or whenever at UCLA, and it's certainly not the same kind of head coaching deal that he had when he was at Oregon. Yeah, I just think that uh, what a coup this is for Ohio State to uh, get a guy – who spent most of the last 15 years as the head coach at Oregon, then with the Eagles, the 49ers, and UCLA. I mean, you want to talk about somebody with experience. Uh, you don't get much better or varied experiences than what uh, Chip Kelly has had, you know, known as an offensive guru. As our friend, I love pulling that out every time I can, as our friend Tim May would say, he's a guru. But, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, – I'm excited to see where this leads for Ohio State. And, uh, you know, people talk about uh, – Chip Kelly is uh, – you know, people think, oh, he's going to throw the ball over the lot. He's loosey-goosey. He's, you know, going to do this, going to do that. But his biggest contribution at UCLA was running the football. I mean, they were outstanding as a running team in the Pac-12. Now, again – how rugged and physical is the Pac-12? Maybe he saw that uh, to be the outlier in that area as a way to move the sticks. But uh, he did uh, produce Dorian Thompson Robinson, who I did get a chance to see play a little bit for the Cleveland Browns this year. Uh, he got dinged up just as every other quarterback on that roster did uh, before the end of the season. But uh, I did think Dorian Thompson Robinson has got some a little bit of promise, and I thought he did – pretty well uh, there at uh, UCLA. So, uh, you know, I it, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's kind of leaving, you know, at the right time. He just beat USC. I think they – didn't they beat a Mountain West team in their bowl game there at SoFi? So, um, I mean, I don't know what else uh, UCLA fans would have wanted out of Chip Kelly. That's kind of the high watermark for them. Martin Jarmond, his athletic director, was not committed – uh, to uh, investing in the program. They had no money to speak of there. They're running a huge $30 million deficit or something. So, uh, you know, Big Ten money as it streams in eventually, I'm not sure if they get a full cut on day one or how we left that last year when they, uh, or two years ago when they were added. But uh, at any rate, uh, he was looking to get out. No question about it. Uh, U USC across town just hired his defensive coordinator away uh, I think at close to $2 million a year, whereas UCLA was probably paying him a little over one or whatever and couldn't afford to keep the guy. And you just beat them, you know I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, what are we doing here? You know? So uh, I can understand completely his frustration with UCLA. And I believe wholeheartedly in his impact at Ohio state. I mean, this is a guy, Chip Kelly, that's never won a national championship, never won a Super Bowl. And uh, I think he looks at this as a chance to help uh, his prized pupil, Ryan Day, get over the hump and win a national championship, win one for himself. And he's in his early 60s, so I'm not sure, as uh, these guys said, he's ready, willing, and able to go back out as a head coach somewhere uh, anytime soon. So it uh, just feels like it's the right time for all concerned. He's taken a pay cut from over $5 million a year probably down to the $2 million level. Uh, as a mental note, I need to send off my FOIA request to Ohio State. Uh, I sent one off on Bill O'Brien, and he was gone before they ever fulfilled it. So, uh, yeah, we don't even know what uh, what he was going to make at Ohio State, but I would assume Chip Kelly's making at least $2 million a year at Ohio State. So, uh, bully for all these guys, and uh, hopefully – this is the right combination of people to, to bring Ohio State uh, back on top of that uh, college football mountain. I'm waiting until the staff is fully done before sending mine in, Steve, just so I don't have to send in two. Yeah, I hear you. Are you paying for the stamp? That, 
they don't even have to like claim you got to pay for the photocopies or anything anymore because they just send you the PDF. So it all works out pretty well. I will say in terms of the running game in 2022 or in 2021 and the, uh, the the softness or the physicality, UCLA ran through LSU, beat them up on the on, at the line of scrimmage in 2021, rushed for 210 yards on 47 carries. They've they've had success against USC. Obviously, they've had success against Utah um, at times. Not last year, but in the year before in 2022, rushed for over 200 yards on them. So they they can get it going, and he has a way of doing that. And uh, I'm interested to see how he brings in his style because I, I thought. We we expected to see some of that with Justin Fry, and I don't know how much of that we really got of the Chip Kelly running game when Fry came over. <clears throat> yeah, and that's – I mean, the familiarity between Fry and Kelly I think will be important. Now, it's certainly not the type of uh, familiarity that there is between Day and Kelly, but uh, for for Chip to come in and, and have an offens- offensive line coach that he's worked with before and – Obviously, the O-line uh, last year was in, was in some previous years, too, has been kind of a point of consternation for for fans, and there have been issues. It'll be interesting to see what is identified with the current roster of players and certainly coming out of spring ball if Ohio State is active in the portal because uh, the, the you know Chip Kelly – doesn't feel that Ohio State has the pieces that it needs to be able to execute at the level that he's going to expect. If we see a young guy maybe get a chance to move up because under the previous system, it just wasn't necessarily working out right. And, you know, is this is this an opportunity for Luke Montgomery to sit there and, 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 and stake a claim to a tackle position for a couple of years? Is, you know, is this bounce well for Tegra or or for Zen or somebody like that. Um, there are a lot of points that I'm really looking forward to as as spring practice, I believe, starts March 5th, if I remember right. So uh, there's I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, and I'm, I'm only disappointed that it doesn't appear that we're going to get any interview opportunities at least this week. But I'm, I'm hopeful for next week that we get to talk to at least one or two of the new coaches. I think because it was tucked away on the West Coast, a lot of people missed that uh, two years ago with Dorian Thompson Robinson at quarterback, UCLA came within about a 15-yard completion of kicking a game-winning field goal against USC and going to the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, And they would have played Utah, whom they, to Tony's point, um, well, I think he was citing the 21, yeah, the 21 game against LSU, but 22 against Utah, they had beaten them in the regular season. So UCLA had some success. I think that 22 team could have been much better from a record standpoint. They were that close. They blew a double-digit lead in the bowl game. Uh, they were a really good team. Uh, and yes, I, I have often wondered about the dynamic of successful head coach then on another side of his career or needing a stopgap job, filling that out on a staff under another coach who's not as accomplished, although that could be argued in this situation, but not as accomplished. And that dynamic, although like everybody has alluded to, Chip Kelly's pretty much waved the white flag in regards to his head coaching career, at least at this point at UCLA. He gave up on that. Uh, we'll see maybe he's preferring the NFL. Of course, he made his NFL circuit. That was unsuccessful in trying to find a job there. But if he finds that uh, the recruiting is not going to be that much that taxing or that expected of him at, at, in the college game that he sticks around at Ohio State, we shall see. Ryan Dawes, thank you so much, sir. We do appreciate you being here. Thank you for the contribution. Chip Kelly to Ohio State is a great move. Plenty of familiarity with Day and Big Fry Guy. 24 is going to be a great one. Or else. It better be. Yeah, for all of the great great off-season feelings or whatever, if... uh... Things don't go well. God, God help everybody, uh, especially with the twelve-team playoff. And I think there's going to have to be the reminder that you don't have to go 
12 and 0 necessarily to make the playoff, but the expectations around here are going to be sky high with roster moves, with coaching moves, with with structural moves in terms of Ryan Day relinquishing play calling and everything else. If it does not end up being a great one, um, I don't know what do we have? Ohio State men's basketball. <laughs> It's 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 going to be uh, it's 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 going to be a lot of uh, difficult conversations at that point. It's all about this playoff. If they go undefeated and they get upset in the second round, people will not be happy. If they go ten and two, people are not going to be happy unless, as a nine seed, they get hot and psh, they're in the national championship game three weeks later. Well, remember the first year of the college football playoff, Ohio State gets in as a four, has to hang 59 on Wisconsin and go through Alabama in New Orleans, you know, pretty much in the backyard and and does it. So would it be surprising if Ohio State were able to maybe come in, have to play a first round game this year and, and get hot at the right time? Uh, I would rather just see it a much simpler way. Ohio State goes 12 and 0, then 13 and 0, gets the first round by, cuts down a little bit on on travel expenses. As I don't think anybody has really quite wrapped their head around how hard it's going to be to follow this team through a deep postseason run. Not going to be able to do it. Yeah, fans are going to be making decisions that they don't want to make about do I go to this game or that game because how at Ohio State's level, how many people are going to be celebrating, truly celebrating a second-round playoff win? I'll be like, uh, checked it off, next, let's mm -hmm. go. I think it's going to be a lot more of like your regional, you know, your regional alumni groups. I mean, at least with Ohio State being – such a, an immense alumni association. If you get out to the Rose Bowl or whatever, you've got all of your West Coast types that are probably going to want to hammer that more than they would going all the way out to Atlanta for the championship game. It, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting because I certainly remember years of just the four-team playoff and either Clemson fans or somebody else kind of – Hunting on the semifinals, going well. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that they're getting to the championship game, so I'm putting all my eggs in that, in that basket. So it'll be interesting to see what these, what these games look like. It's not like any of them are necessarily going to be a lot of vacant seats, but will a lot of it just be townies and 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 and, and vendors? And such, or will, will you get that big push from from alumni going out where you could? legitimately be on the road for four games if if you come in as a as as a, a bottom team in the playoff. Buckeyes live here every uh, Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. However, we've got schedules to coordinate, so sometimes it's another day of the week. So please subscribe and uh, hit that bell for the notifications to know when we go live. Amazon links in the description section of all the videos. You can support us here at the Voice of College Football by buying your things at uh, Amazon, but using our link, it's uh, transparent to you. Doesn't cost you a penny. NFL Combine coming up uh, in March in Indianapolis, as always. And uh, Michigan fans are touting what is reported to be a record class of 18. And uh, I am not disparaging them because in this rivalry, Everybody touts everything that they can tally on a board or number. So that's just the way it is between these two fan bases. All right. Ohio State's got eight. It could have been a whole lot uh, greater than that, but uh, that's a good thing. So we got Marvin Harrison Jr., Mayan Williams, Kate Stover, Matthew Jones. We've got Mike Hall Jr., Tommy Eichenberg, Steel Chambers, and Josh Proctor, Kevin your thoughts about the NFL Combine group? Yeah, uh, of all the Buckeyes that could have really gone to the Combine with expectations of going, eight of nine went. The only one that didn't uh, make the cut was Xavier Johnson. He'll have to wait for Ohio State's Pro Day to kind of show what he is capable of doing in front of NFL personnel. I believe Ohio State had eight last year, but 
365 days ago, I think we were looking at this 24 combine. It's like, well, there could be 20 Buckeyes there. Well, the year didn't go necessarily as planned, and everybody, everybody for the most part, has come back. Um, you know, I'm certainly going to be excited to to hear all the conversation around around Marvin. We've already started to see some of these quote unquote experts really drill into, well, he doesn't do this well, he doesn't do that well. And there's some former NFL scout that's saying, oh, he's like my number five receiver on the board, not number five prospect on the board, number five receiver. Uh, you know, I, I saw another guy came in and say that, you know, uh, he has Marvin second. I think Mike Hall did a lot to better his stock at the uh, at the Senior Bowl, did not participate in the game. Always of note who who works out, who does what. I mean, so you'll have some guys who do the full complement, some guys who are just there to do interviews, and some that will do bits and pieces as they get poked and prodded. And to the earlier point about Michigan's uh, hall there, yeah, when you have 44 seniors, and I understand not all of them were necessarily scholarship seniors, but when you have that type of setup there and you – win a few damn games, you should probably put a lot of guys in the combine. But whatever records Michigan is setting here in 24, Ohio State will break in 25 because Ohio State has its own its, it, its own giant bubble of players that will all be hitting their last year of eligibility at about the same time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I haven't necessarily looked at a roster yet to do a full count, but I'm going to say 20 and a half is going to probably be my – without thought over under and what Ohio state puts in the combine, unless the NFL is really like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. whoa. We just, you know, we just, we can't do that. We can't do that. And, 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 and puts a couple guys out on the periphery. But then again, I, I don't think it's their job necessarily to be the fairness gatekeeper. It's not a case that the Colorado Rockies have to have an all-star player in this game. Um, I looking forward to the combine as always. Uh, this is like 15 or 16 years. I may have missed one of them in the last 15 or 16 years. Been there uh, pretty religiously here uh, in recent years, and uh, it, it it is kind of illuminating, I think, to hear what players have to say about uh, their own draft stock, and then also talking to them about. Uh, all the guys that, that Ohio State will have on the team this coming year, they'll be able to talk to a lot of them about uh, a lot of the guys that they played with and the coaches that they played for. And uh, certainly for Michigan, I think there's going to be a lot of questions to those guys, and, and we'll see how they hold up about uh, what they knew and, and uh, what the, the the whole setup was with uh, – you know, Connor Stallions and how that whole went. They're going to get besieged with those questions probably. Some of them, at least the quarterback, McCarthy, and some of the guys who were, you know, maybe a little closer to the brain trust than uh, just actual players. But uh, so, yeah, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting things discussed uh, at this combine. And, and I would agree with Kevin. I, I don't know off the top of my head what the number for Iowa State would be next year probably 15, 16, 17. I don't even know, maybe more. I, I don't know. I haven't counted it up yet, but uh, going to be a lot of guys. And a lot of that, of course, predicated on how good the Buckeyes do this coming year. So uh, going to be, again, uh, you know, you look at it, Marvin Harrison, he's going in there. Uh, be interested to see if he does anything on field at all, or if he just waits for the Ohio State Pro Day, if he runs, which – you know, a lot of times the top guys don't necessarily run. So it, it, it'll it be, you know, again, interesting. To, but he seems like a gamer, a guy that really doesn't care and will go out there and put his best foot forward and, and knock it out of the park, whatever it is. That's kind of been his MO the entire time is he didn't care when it was or where it was. He just performed. And I think that, uh, you know, there's a potential for him to maybe do that, depending on what his representatives think, uh, you know, his agents and his dad, what they think he should do. So uh, that'll be a, a storyline as we get closer to that in a couple of weeks when the combine rolls around. Uh, some other guys uh, hoping to lift their stock. I mean, my call was kind of banged up the last couple of years, but he did really well at the senior bowl. So he's a guy who's probably moving up some draft charts. And if he does well at the combine with his interviews and his on, 
field and his weightlifting and everything else, then maybe he's a guy that moves up. Uh, those two linebackers, Tommy Eichenberg, he ended his career injured. Uh, you know, how healthy is he to go through drills and on-field stuff? Steel Chambers, little little question, you know, is he an every down guy at the NFL level at linebacker? I'm not sure about that. So uh, just, just a lot of questions, I think, for some of these other guys that are probably second, third, fourth, third day type guys. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. I just ran a bunch of numbers in the old computer. I've got uh, 17 guys, and that's only two guys turning pro early when Quinshawn Judkins and uh, Igben Oson. That's crazy. So yeah. if, um, you know, can anybody else jump forward, you know, uh, whether it's Sonny Styles or C.J. Hicks or uh, one of the two defensive ends that aren't starting, you know, like a Caden Courier, Kenyatta Jackson. Um, or Josh Simmons, perhaps something like that. So that's that's just a quick uh, accounting of, of what I had there. But that's more than any combine I can ever remember for Ohio State. So it's a it'll be an opportunity for a bunch of guys. Assuming all of those guys would get invited, and you know we will see. Um, Didn't they but, have like twelve guys drafted, which was a record for a seven round draft in like uh, twenty sixteen? Does that sound right? Like two years. 14? After well, they had the record with the year that Zeke went of having whatever 16. it was, like five in the top, like yeah. 25 or something, and it was a deep draft. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'll just – for Steve, who's covered a lot of draft or a lot of combines, yeah, they'll have 17, 18, 19 guys all at the podium all at the same time because that's just how these things work. Um, I, I believe they – they had the original record of like 14 after it but in the 2004 draft following the 2003 season with all of those guys. Yeah, from um, the championship. I think so. But then that, that got passed by I don't know, a handful of years ago. I think by they an got Alabama tied or by, Georgia. Yeah. I, I LSU think it was maybe. Miami and Ohio State and then LSU eclipsed that and then Georgia. Is, and I, I think believe. Michigan's going to have a pretty big draft, but it's going to be a lot of day three guys more than day one. They had 14 in the 04 draft, is, and it was like 12 in that uh, 16 draft. I've, I've got the list in front of me right now. I don't have them like ranked. I just have, all, you know, thank you, Wikipedia. I've just got it in front of me. All right, folks, uh, we've got a question coming in from our guy, David Greenshield, getting back to the quarterback situation. Thoughts on uh, Julian Sane passing Aaron Noland on the depth chart? My thought is there is no depth chart for the true freshman. And if you put one over the other, would be putting one into the transfer portal. So don't do it. Just – Give them, treat them all equally as if they're your twin sons and you don't want to turn one into the evil twin and the other into the good twin. So just keep them both medium twins. Yeah, I think, I think, I think Tony hit it on the head last week. He kind of corrected me. I think I thought Howard would start out, you know, and be the number one, but I, I agree it should be Brown number one to start. Then Keenhold, well, Howard and Keenhold's kind of on a level, and then Sand and Noland on a level, however you dole out the reps. And, you know, over time, probably by practice five or six, Howard is, you know, interchanging with Brown or, you know, supplanting him as number one. And then you just kind of go from there. And you really you explain it to him like this, like Sand is – let's just say number four one day and Nolan is number four the next, you know, I mean, if somebody's got to be one, somebody's got to be two, somebody's got to be three, somebody's got to be four and somebody's got to be five. And it's really not a statement on how good you are. You're all going to get opportunities and you just manage it. You just manage it the best way that you can, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to put saying and, and, uh, Aaron Noland out there with the first team the first four days. It just, just doesn't make any sense because they're they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. They're they're going to turn the wrong way, 
they're not going to know what to do. And now you've wasted reps with the first team. So you don't do that. You, you gradually bring them along to the level that they can handle. And by week three, maybe one of them's moving the first team up and down the field. We got something here, you know, and everybody sees it and it's apparent. And then you, then you bump them up a little bit into production and in the rotation, but it's done over time. It's not something where you just stick somebody in there to fail because that makes no sense. So, uh, you know, to me, uh, it'll be logical uh, between Ryan Day and Chip Kelly, they got about 50 years of coaching experience and uh, they know what they're doing. So I, I, in Chip and Ryan, you have to trust. You just, you just have to trust. If those two guys can't get you to the promised land, then who the hell will? That's kind of my feeling. I I mean, I would, I'm not concerned about a, a depth chart at all right now anyway, because they're not running install. They're not, they're not, I mean, they run however many periods, 24, 27 periods. How many of them are really, you know, seven on seven, 11 on 11. There's just a lot of stuff where you're just going through and learning, you know, learning the position and, and doing mechanics and things of that nature. Yeah. So where, you know, where you are, I mean, who you follow and who follows you is kind of immaterial at this point. Now, you know, if there's, one receiver that just always keeps dropping the ball, be like, all right, change places with me in line. I'm just, I don't want to keep throwing to this dude. But, uh, you know, outside of that, I wouldn't get too caught up. I, I don't think any of us are, are trying to put a line on what, uh, what the spring game is going to look like. If the Scarlet or the gray is going to win there, uh, you know, things will, things will work themselves out, but to, to echo what both, uh, both uh, Tony and Steve said, there's just no real reason to, pin yourself down and be like, you're the one, you're the two, you're the three. I mean, especially right now. And then once you get into drill work and everything else, you have the cover of being like, well, the other guy was sharper. So we're going to have him run with the threes this, uh, you know, this next practice. And no, oh, you were, you were better this time. All right, we'll have you run with the threes. And maybe you just have some movement anyway. So everybody is having a better opportunity to work with, the entire team to work with the entire receiver core, the inside the entire tight end core, everything else. Uh, you know, you're just, you don't, you're not, you're not going to sit there and do something in this spring that is going to sit there and be worth three points in October. I mean, so, I mean, I just, I, I I'm not going to get too caught up on it. Yeah. And, and the, with the depth chart, the spring is about um, the individual getting the individual better the team stuff comes in fall so really you know i'm sure like steve said we've seen them do this in the past with two quarterbacks is with, with some days you're the one some days you're the one and it's always interesting we the first thing we do the first practice we get to look at we see who's repping first and boom that guy right now is the number one and then you see the next practice you're like oh new number one because it's somebody else and it's just like well they're just alternating and that's why it that's why it's better to get a look later on in camp to see the changes but if you don't get to see the first couple of days to see like any kind of rotation like every time we get to see these a practice we make sweeping judgments because that's all we get to look at same with everybody that goes to the spring game and they see joe burrow outperforming dwayne haskins or whatever and it's like well joe burrow is the best guy or they see justin fields go four of 13 or three of 14 whatever it was in 2019 you're like oh my gosh we're doomed and it's just one practice and you you try not to make too much of it but you do because that's our job I mean, is to make stuff <laughs> make stuff of nothing no not actually but to take that information, convey it, and try to make some judgments about it. And I can't wait to see practice on uh, Tuesday the 5th because there's a bunch of stuff I want to see. I want to know where is Emeka Abuka lining up? Where is Sonny Styles lining up? Where is C.J. Hicks in this situation? Where is um, you know the quarterback situation, as we've talked about? And uh, just who are the top three receivers? Because they are kind of positionless at this point. You know, at, we're, We all want to see Jeremiah Smith. So there's a bunch of stuff to to watch. You know, first look at Caleb Downs. 
but it is just one practice in spring meant to improve the individual people and especially the first two practices because they have a practice Tuesday, a practice Thursday, then they go on spring break and then they're back in like 10 days. So those first two practices are, are very easy and, and uh, as low impact as you can get, maybe the two easiest practices of the year which is why we should also be able to watch the entire thing, uh, the entire practice of both, both days, in my opinion. But I understand none of you here are the head coach or the SID. Yeah, and then we also get that first roster, and then we can start thinking about the video game and when it comes out and everything else. And since the way it's set up now, we won't have to spend time putting names on on these numbers and everything else. But – that game and having to build rosters was how I was so strong with roster numbers, not only for Ohio State, but the entire Big Ten, because right out of the box, I would put in the entire Big Ten just to be ready. So, um, I, yeah, I could probably, I, I, I'm going to write off my football me. game because it is going, I need it for work. <laughs> I'm writing it off. I'm just telling you right now, Mr. IRS, I'm writing that sucker off. <laughs> I can go grab one of my Phil Steele magazines and have players checked off that I've put into the game from back way back in the day and make sure, oh, got to get these freshmen in. They've missed these freshmen, you know. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was essentially a study guide, the the game and the Phil Steele mag and all of that stuff. And, and they've taken that away from us, which is unfortunate. But uh, I'm sure my North Texas Eagles are going to be my green, mean green, are going to be way off, way incorrect, so I'll have to fix some things there. Tony will be that guy going out to buy either a PS5 or Xbox One like the day that the game comes out. And he and a whole bunch of other people, and there will be fights in the streets, and these will be like Cabbage Patch Kids, and I will just be sitting there laughing. Steve was running through, uh, if you go through the decorum of, you know, giving uh, – weight to the experience and who's been on campus then you start out with this depth chart because that's the way you know protocol should be mm -hmm. well lincoln keenholz led that prolific field goal drive in the cotton bowl so shouldn't he be number one yeah I mean, he's game battle tested game proven <laughs> sure that poor guy. between saying and noland is it uh, so Saiyan is generally a couple ranks higher in the recruiting rankings. And obviously once they step on field, who cares? Let's go. Let's see what you got. Uh, is that one of those deals where the top five quarterbacks are all, you know, put them in a bucket. They're the same guy in terms of not necessarily skill set, what they do well, but in terms of when it all shakes out, or is this more of a, there's a Trevor Lawrence or a Justin Fields in this class. And then there's a drop off, uh, how are these guys evaluated coming into it? I mean, I think both of them, you know, certainly checked off a lot of, a lot of boxes. Ohio State certainly kicked the tires on saying again before before kind of opening up its it, its search and landing on Aaron Nolan. I mean, the one thing that people are going to have to get used to with Aaron Nolan is he's a lefty, and I'm not necessarily saying that you have to completely coach a lefty differently, but you have to be familiar with coaching a lefty and you have to have, you know, there is a little bit of a different look of how the ball comes out of his hands and everything else. I mean, is saying like, like legitimately multiple rungs above Nolan? No, I don't think so. But I think, you know, I think that there are certain things that Sayin does that's more complete than what Nolan has done. But I also think that it's a case of, you know, both of them have come out of real deal districts in their states, you know, with 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 Nolan outside of Atlanta, with with Sayin in Southern California, Southern CIF competition. There are going to be things that you know about each of them just based on what their what their rosters were and what they were able to do. Nolan's Langston Hughes team here in 23 was not nearly as good as the team in 22. So people are going to be like, did he regress? Has he maxed out or is he done? Well, he didn't have the weapons around him. Julian saying out there and where he was Calabasas or wherever, I mean, he always has dudes around him. So there's just, there's not going to be any appearance of him necessarily regressing because he has so much out there. So 
I'm not one to get too caught up in the rankings and being like, okay, well, this guy's just clearing away such a definitive number one that the number two guy really should be like four or five. There just isn't anybody who fits in between them. I, th- I think that that both guys will have their moments of where they will show a lot. It's just going to be a matter of who fits the system better and who 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 takes to things. I mean, that's just ultimately what it comes down to. I'm speaking the obvious here, but our Miami guy came underwood on Wednesday night. He laments every week about losing Jeremiah Smith. Now he's the number one player in the country. They so, never had I'm speaking they the obvious. But, well, <laughs> yes. Okay. Never being able to secure the signing of Jeremiah Smith. Well, but, uh, just a Miami approach. Those Ohio State broke Miami a long time ago. Anyway, I'm Mark, going. go on. <laughs> Sorry. I'll mute myself. It's basically that this dude is otherworldly and should just basically step on the field and not that he's not going to have growing pains and going to have to adjust to, you know, the, the increased level of play that he's facing, but just that he's incredible. Kind of thing. Uh, there are people that I, I respect who think he's a day one starter, and, and I'm I'm still in the point where I'll believe it when I see it. I'm not going to annoy anybody to be that day one starter as a true freshman. But if there was somebody, it might be <laughs> it might be Jeremiah Smith, especially losing two starting receivers. There are opportunities, and this is not the deepest receiver room that Ohio State has had under Brian Hartline. But um, Day Ryan Day was saying he he stepped right in in terms of the weight room and. Um, just a hard worker, not for, for as much drama as there was in actually getting the signature. There has not been drama since he has been on campus, that sort of thing. And he's just gone to work. So um, I'll, I think it also depends on where Emeka Ibuka is playing in terms of if Jeremiah Smith is a day one starter, but uh, he's still, he, you know, Carnell Tate got lost his black stripe and after five spring practices. So that's, that's the watermark for me right now on Jeremiah Smith. And if he passes that, then we can start to, then I will start believing more and more. Not that I'm a disbeliever, but I, I want to see something first. Like, because I will say spring practice, Garrett Wilson in 2019, Jackson Smith and Jigba in 2020. Those two guys, Jackson Smith and Jigba in 2020 was some of the most incredible stuff I've ever seen in just one spring practice. And that was before the world shut down. He was catching everything making people look silly. The only drop he had, it wasn't even a drop. It was just a catch out of bounds, falling in traffic. And so I want to see something like that from Jeremiah Smith. And if I do, then then we can talk. And, and not that we won't talk about it more, but I, I want to see uh, I want to see it first. And I and then then we can go from there. But uh I'll set the over under on black stripe practices uh at like Four and a half because either you're 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 not as good, or, you know, or maybe is it should we just go in even five and can you either beat Carnell Tate or not? You're on mute, Kevin. Your own damage. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I forced him Dennis, to mute. Dennis Dodd, you're muted. Yeah, I it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. It's the guy driving over there. I'm just gonna say that um <laughs> Ultimately, maybe with a, no, a new OC and some different philosophy there, we don't see the top three receivers necessarily getting like 104% of the targets. And they they run a little bit uh, deeper in their rotations, and that that's allowed, and that, uh, that gives runway for Tate and Ennis and Jeremiah Smith and some of these other guys to where you're not trying to win somebody specifically a Heisman or Bolitnikoff or anything like that. You can do complimentary pieces. Did somebody say win totals? <laughs> immediately I went to Google. Ohio State. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, weren't we? Ten and a half mm-hmm. minus 150 on the over plus 120 on the under. Who's playing what? I'd take over on that. And I saw that, what, Michigan's nine and a half, and I would play under on that. I already have. Yeah, I, I, need, to, under. I, need, to, I, I need to fund my account so I can make that bet is what I probably need to do. 
I mean, I'm not retiring on the bet that I made there, but I put something just to have it in there. I had some money in FanDuel or one of them. I don't know. Um, and, you know, the Ohio State one, it's so easy here in February and March to sit there and say, 12-0, and 0, baby. And then you start to see maybe a couple of the little, you know, wrinkles that are there, a little little troublesome mole that you don't know what to do with, things like that. And you have to kind of go from there. But Penn State and Oregon are obviously on the road. Those are going to be two of the biggest games being circled. And then, of course, being on the wrong end of a couple few matchups against the team up north. I mean, how many how many high leverage games are there on the schedule for for Ohio State? And then you know, where, how do how does it go? I mean, I I think eleven and one is probably likely. So by that, I should I should say sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet the over, but I don't know. I don't I don't feel feel that the return on investment is 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 great there because I don't have a lot of. Uh, I don't have a lot of room for that uh, that game that doesn't go the right way. Yeah, thirty to win twenty doesn't doesn't sound all that palatable to me, but whatever. Uh, one of the ones that I saw that I I feel kind of strongly about is Nebraska at seven and a half. Um, if if they're starting a true freshman quarterback, I'll take the under on that one, just because. Um, as we know, freshman quarterbacks will. Lose you at least one game that they shouldn't, and uh, Nebraska will lose you at least three games that you shouldn't. So there's four losses already. And now, yeah, now even Matt Rule right. couldn't solve that riddle. Yeah. So the end of um, that I, Iowa game needs to be put in the Lou. That was just uh, <laughs> or the Lou, the Lou, whatever Lou, yeah, yeah, the Lou, the L O O, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, every year I fall victim into buying into Nebraska, and every year it bites me in the butt. Um, I didn't buy into them last year, which Lucy Van Pelt, the ball carrier. Yeah, which was uh, which was was great. I don't Divine Ozigbo is not walking through that door for them. So uh, yeah, I think that the under maybe maybe I need to sit there and put together a nice little under parlay with like Michigan, Nebraska, and somebody else. Wow. Yeah, I have yet to look at these across the board. But, uh, yeah, Nebraska is a tough one. But until they prove it, yeah, they're they're one of those programs that uh, is kind of like wait and see. You know, show it to me one time that you can win close games. And like Tony says, Rayola is going to be the guy. And the thing is, if he's not, is that even worse? Oh. If, you know. If, Another year of Heinrich Heiner Herbert. Yeah, exactly. And I like Matt Rule. I think he's he's a very, very good coach. But we've seen that one. I don't know how much better Harburg is going to get. I think you almost have to just go through the, the struggles with Rayola and hope that it turns out better next year. But then you also have to assume that he's going to stick around. And I, at this point, I don't know that you can't assume he's going to be in the same place for two years in a row. With Nebraska's schedule – they play three teams from the East, so that's just like uh, the old format, Ohio State, Rutgers, Indiana. Then you supplant two Western teams with a trip to USC and a trip to Lincoln from UCLA. So that's got to be tougher than Minnesota and uh, Northwestern. So you've taken out Minnesota Northwestern in a typical year, the old format, and you've replaced them with USC and UCLA. Don't know what to make of UCLA this year. Yeah. I mean, obviously with its change, I mean, that USC is really going to be a bad matchup for Nebraska. Uh, I know that Caleb Williams has moved on, but the quarterback that they rolled out in the bowl game, you know, the meaning meaningless exhibition game looked pretty, pretty okay there. I think they're going to be able to put a lot of points up and Nebraska just isn't going to be able to get into a shooting gallery type of match and, 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 and hang with anybody. Faithful viewer Mike3883 asked if I can find it. Basically, Ohio State does not win the national championship. Why? Hmm. Why or if? 
Well, I guess if Offensive they line. lose the last game. Why, Steve? Why? Oh, why? Because they suck. Because <laughs> they suck again in the big games like they did this past year. Uh, that's that's kind of the long and short of it. I mean, I, I can't I – mean, I, hell, I mean, that, that to me is the lone Achilles heel. I mean, I think if there were a, a rash of injuries to key people, obviously, and then you didn't have people behind them step up, that would be a, a factor, obviously, as well. You can't even – foresee something like that. Um, but uh, to me, if they can't line up and get three yards when they need to get three yards or pass protect worth the crap in the big games, then, and that's, you know, at Oregon, Penn State, at Penn State, at home with Michigan, Big Ten Championship, and then uh, playoff. I mean, wow. Playoffs, that's like five or six big games right there that you're counting on these guys coming through. So uh, where they didn't last year. So, uh, you know, that's 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 the big step up for this team. And they're going to get battle tested this spring. They were battle tested last spring by this same defensive line. It was so bad. They went out and got Josh Simmons in the portal. Uh, what's going to be the temperature of of this thing after spring practice? Yeah, are Ryan Day and Chip Kelly going to look at each other and say, who's available? Let's go. You know, let's go get somebody. And uh, whether it's a Boston College Aussie dude or, you know, somebody from UCLA that uh, Kelly coached or, you know, whoever it may be, uh, you know, go get somebody that, that can play. Because, you know, the three years of, of coming close, you know, it's – it's not good enough. And, you know, one year you say, okay, you know, shame on me. Three years, shame on you. You got to go get the players, you know, go buy the players you need to buy to win the national championship. It's time to quit screwing around. That's just, just my overall feeling on it. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at, go ahead, go ahead, at the, I'm looking at the, uh, you know, Ohio State used to run the ball really, really well when Justin Fields was the quarterback. They'd lead the Big Ten by a wide margin. So over the last three years, in, in Big Ten games, Ohio State has hit the 200-yard rushing mark 10 times total in the last three years. And Justin Fields, two seasons at Ohio State, and one of those being a COVID-shortened season, the only time they didn't hit 200 yards rushing in a Big Ten game was the 2019 Big Ten Championship game against Wisconsin. Every other time, they're over 200, 200 or 300 yards. So that's 14 regular season games in, in the Big Ten over those two seasons, just with uh, Justin Fields. And, and you know, and one of those years was great with J.K. Dobbins. The, the, the 2020, they're starting out with Master Teague, and eventually he gets benched for Trey Sermon. And Trey Sermon was not fantastic that year until the Big Ten championship game, essentially. So they can do it. They've shown they can do it with a quarterback that provides a threat. And that's something that Ryan Day talked to us about a week ago or whenever it was that you can't win that last game or you, in order to win that last game, you need to run the ball. And when he says that last game, he's talking about Michigan and it's not something they've been able to do. And uh, so, yeah, the results are not tricky. The, the lack of running has hurt them. So, just getting that threat back, and they have five guys now who can provide that threat. They want to get back to that. Chip Kelly has run his quarterbacks here and there. 100 carries a year is about what you should expect from that quarterback. That's including sacks. So just that threat slows the defense down a little bit, and if it doesn't slow them down, then the quarterback takes off for 17 yards. And now you know if, if you don't want to worry about the quarterback run, then Ohio State will go ahead and take those chunks that way or do some RPO stuff and things like that. But I think uh, I think they will run the ball better this year, regardless of the offensive line. I do think the offensive line is better than it was a year ago at this point. There's no debating that one. And I also don't think you can judge this offensive line based on what we saw against Missouri because it's not the same offensive line. So I think um, I think it's good enough to win it all. And so what won't get it done? Just I used to have terrible bounces against really good teams, terrible calls against really good teams, terrible just unforced errors against uh, really good teams. So just have the ball bounce your way for a change, and I think that could be the difference. 
whether it's a 50 yard field goal or it's not, or it's a replay official not buzzing down to overturn a fumble return for a touchdown or buzzing down to over to call a targeting that the refs didn't call something. Just don't have that happen. And I think, uh, you know, that could be the difference. I'll go quickly through a couple of things, and I agree with everything that both uh, Tony and Steve have said. I think if the handoff of offensive play calling to Chip Kelly isn't complete and final and, and everything else, that you could see a muddied spot where they're conflicting signals, that could create some issues. I think that Ohio State is obviously trying to make changes in how it handles special teams with the departure of Parker Fleming. Special teams are fall into that bad bounces, bad break type of situation. And then lastly, is it's it's all about matchups. And there might be a matchup out there of somebody that just does everything that Ohio State does poorly. And that's kind of the that's like the biggest and the, I guess maybe the most obvious bugaboo is you know just a bad matchup. And it's way too early to know who might be a bad matchup. I don't think we know where the weak points in Ohio State's armor may be, per se, in, in in 24. But there could be a team that just is not not to Ohio State's liking, and they could face them, and, and, and that could that could knock uh, a, a season off, you know, off its marks. Absolutely. Kevin, what uh, is going on there at uh, Buckeye Huddle and with you this week? Yeah, um, I am in my three-day-a-week uh, podcasting schedule as the dog is squeaking a toy next to me. I'm going to record something as soon as I jump off of this. I think that uh, I may do a live show on Thursday. And then I am on the road over the weekend hitting a couple of camps. We'll have lots of recruiting coverage over at BuckeyeHuddle.com as well as on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. So look for a lot of a lot of recruiting stuff to come up here over the next several days. Tony. Yeah, and there's actually a bunch of recruiting stuff right now because Mark Givler was down at the uh, Orlando Under Armour event. So you can find that at BuckeyeHuddle.com as well. I just dropped a piece before we jumped on about uh, how, how Ohio State's going to go about replacing Marvin Harrison. So good luck with all of that and doing that. Jeremiah and, Smith. Uh, no, there you go. Mark fit. Boom. Two words. Google doesn't like something that short. I'll just let you know. The analytics don't like that. So you got to stretch that out to at least 300 just for future reference. Uh, but also I, I got to get something written about Caleb Downs. cut up a bunch of clips. And so I wanted to go ahead and take a closer look at him and write about uh, what he's going to bring to Ohio State. Steve. Just the usual, just try and get through the day. I'll be going to the, back to this my home away from home, the Schottenstein Center tonight, number two Ohio State women's basketball against Nebraska. It's on uh, Peacock. Nebraska is the team that just upset Iowa over the weekend. Buckeyes alone in first place. And men's team lost to Wisconsin last night. And uh, Purdue, number two in the country, coming to town on Sunday. So uh, the big guy, they're going to have to watch his head going through the uh, – the doorways there at the shot. He's seven foot four. So uh, we'll see how that goes uh, on Sunday. But uh, basketball kind of taking center stage right now until uh, we get closer to spring football here in the next several weeks. And uh, obviously all kinds of Chip Kelly stuff. And uh, Dave Biddle and I did our uh, morning podcast this morning for 30 minutes and devoted about 25 minutes of that to football as well. So check that out as well. I will also say that Jeff Goodman is now saying that Chris Holtman has been fired, so we all have to go. There you go. Folks, hit the like button. And then, yeah, Buckeye Huddle and Bucknuts for all of that and more. Lock in. Get there. Follow these guys. Okay. Wow. All right. We will see you all next week with that. See you guys. Take care.